Good evening, everybody. Thank you again for joining. It's lovely to keep seeing the same names in my participants box, session after session. And a special welcome, of course, to those joining at home, using this as a revision tool after the event. You are also very welcome. What we are going to be doing this evening is to have a look at uh, task five and task three. So starting with the task number five, which covers off the wages control account and the area of irrecoverable debts, and particularly how we deal with those. Like what are the double entries involved with getting those into our accounts? And then task number three, a bit of a mixed bag, really, because that has a couple of different areas. First area being perhaps choosing an appropriate payment method. Often we have to link a particular payment with a suitable payment method. So we're going to be working on that. And then also a little bit on errors generally at the end of a task three. So they're going to be our two topics for this evening. So we're going to start with the task number five topic. And I say this in every uh, session, but I'll say it again. If you are new to our materials, or this is your first recording that you have uh, listened to, then just know, that in this little set of revision questions, we start each one with a little chat about what the task will include. So task five is all about using the journal. And within the journal, we're going to be preparing journals for things like payroll. We're also going to be preparing journal entries for things like um, writing off a irrecoverable debt, a debt that's never going to be received, so that sort of thing. So we've got payroll transactions in here. We've got irrecoverable and bad debts, possibly even entry and own imbalances for a new business that can pop up in here, as well as the correction of errors. So if you feel a little bit weak about the topics covered in this section, please go away and read through this task briefing in a bit more detail. I'm not going to do it with you this evening. I want to get straight into the task because I've got two tasks I want to work through, but just know that it's there. So if you struggle a little bit with the content from this evening and you need a little bit more of a refresher that I'm going to give you, then there's a whole set of little revision notes there to take you through this particular area. I'm going to take you straight through to the actual task on page 21. I might actually just open up another page. Um, or might I actually insert it here? Maybe I'll do that. Let me just insert a page. Might just make a, just doing this so I can make a few extra little notes as we chat this through. There we go, right. So the first uh, part of the task then talks about Dippy Dogs. And Dippy Dogs pay their employees by cheque every month and they maintain a wages control account. And I did have some comments in previous sessions that you particularly wanted to revise this wages control account. So here it is. They maintain a wages control account. And we've got a summary then of last month's payroll transactions. So the first thing I want to do is just to get you to think with me about what a wages control account is and what it's for. So without even really looking at this question to start with, we're just going to think about a wages control account. And I do often think that in order to really understand a wages control, you perhaps have to think about the other accounts where the other double entries would go. But the purpose of a wages control account is to make sure that everybody that needs to be paid has been paid and to make sure that all the things that go with wages, like the fact that we've got pay as you earn, the fact that we've got national insurance that needs to be paid to the government, let's make sure that's been paid, make sure the staff have been paid, Let's make sure that the pension contributions are being paid over to the pension company and so on. Let's make sure everything's been accounted for properly. So the wages control account is actually just one account out of a series of other accounts. So what I thought I might just do with you here is just run through how we might construct this wages control account. And then we can um, <clears throat> think about this actual task. So the bit within the wages area that as employees we're probably the most interested in is us receiving our pay. 
And of course, when we receive our pay into our bank, that is called the net wages. So if I had to post the net wages, they would be paid out of the bank account. I'd go to the bank and I'd say, oh, I've paid my staff. So we credit the bank with the net wages and we record those as being a settlement of the wages owing within the wages control account. And if you do find that you struggle with the double entries here, always better to think about the other account involved. So the net wages there are paid from the bank account. I should perhaps have done that the other way around. So net wages can be in the brackets. It's the double entry should actually say bank. This one, net wages are what we're dealing with and the account description should be wages control. And that's the double entry. That's how we deal with our net wages out of the bank into the wages control. Now, the other aspects of wages are that the reason that we receive the net wages are because our employer has taken some money from our pay before we got it. They have deducted some pay as you earn. They have deducted some national insurance. We'd call that the employee national insurance. So these figures would have been deducted from our pay. And the employer then has to give those figures to revenue and customs. They become a liability. So I actually create a revenue and customs liability account. And from the wages control, I say, I'm now responsible for paying the pay as you earn to the government. And I've also got to pay the employee's national insurance across to the government. All of this has been deducted from my staff, but it's not my money to keep. I've got to pay it to the government. So I increase the liability, putting it onto the credit side of the liability account there. I also have another deduction, a bit topical at the moment, perhaps. Before I get my money, I start with my gross pay. They take pay as you earn from me. They take employees' national insurance from me. They might also take my contribution for being a member of the trade union. So then I have a trade union account as well trade union liability. So they take it from me. Take it out of my wages. And we put it in the trade union liability until it's then paid over to the trade union. At this point, we're just recognising it's being taken out of my net wages and there is a liability due to the trade union. So each of these entries is creating a liability because if the employer does not give me the gross pay, they say, oh, no, 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 we can't give you the gross pay because we have to take all this money from you before we can pay you the salary. Fair enough. But when they take the pay as you earn from me, they've got to give it to the government. So it goes here. When they take the national insurance from my salary, they have to pay it to the government. So it also goes into the HMRC liability account. Then they take money from me to pay the trade union. It's a liability until they've actually paid the trade union and so on. And then of course they do pay my net wages. I started with that because it was the most obvious, but when they do eventually pay my net wages, it comes out of the bank and it settles here. So there's only one other entry really for this side of the account now. And the other side, the other entry that's missing here is what we call the employer's national insurance. Because when we employ a staff member, we do take some national insurance out of their salary every month before we give it to them. But we also have additional national insurance that needs to be paid. So as an employer, we don't only have to deal with the employee's contribution towards national insurance. We have to deal with the employer's contribution as well. So that's just recognising that as well as an employee, we have an employer liability. So I've got national insurance, which the employer needs to pay 
also showing as a liability. Now, in the live assessment, you're going to be doing journals, so you're not going to be creating all these control accounts. I just thought this would be a useful way of just revising the topic, showing you what's happening, then we're going to actually launch into this task. So the only figure that's left is the wages expense. What is the cost to me of employing this person? Well, I'm now able to say by employing this person, it costs me their net wages. I have to pay the pay as you earn to the government. I pay their national insurance to the government. I pay some extra national insurance to the government there and I pay um, the trade union subscription as well. So I add together all of that lot and whatever that adds up to is the expense. That is the cost to the company of employing this individual. And another way of find that, finding that cost to company is to say, well, if you know what their gross pay is, so when you get your pay slip, that's the figure that shows before all the deductions. If you know what your gross pay is, and you then add on the employer's national insurance, and possibly, if there was any, there wasn't in my example, but if there was an employer pension contribution as well, we had all those extra employer costs on, and that's our cost to the company. So we can find the wages expense in two ways. Find it by adding together our net wages, together with the pay as you earn, together with the employer's national insurance, together with the trade union, together with the employer's national insurance, plus all the pension contributions. We can add all of that lot together. Or you might say it's a little bit simpler if the question tells me what the gross pay is. If I know the gross pay, then I just add any, add any extra employer costs. That tells me the cost of employing the person. OK, so that's just my revision of the topic. There were no numbers in there, so that's not actually relevant to the example we're going to do. It's just a bit of revision to get us going. So let's now go back to here. And Dippy Dogs, who pays its employees by cheque every month and maintains the wages control. So now, as I look at this, the first thing it wants is to record the wages expense. Then it wants us to record the HMRC liability. So all the things we've actually just talked about. Record the net wages that are paid to the employees and record the trade union liability. Just based on what we've talked about, I'd actually like us to take a step back and just make sure you understand the figures before we get too far into the question. So I would like to find the net pay. I want to calculate what I think the net wages are going to be. So if I know the gross figure, that's what it says at the top of my payslip. It'd be nice if that was my payslip, but uh, gross wages of 6,000. Then the employee pays some national insurance. So that gets knocked off their gross pay. Then there's some employers national insurance. Like the employee doesn't have to pay that. The employer has to pay that one. There's some income tax pays you earn. So the employee has to pay that one. And then there's trade union fees. We choose to be a member of the trade union. We have to contribute towards its operation. We have to contribute to that. So let's see what is left. 6,000 gross, deduct 500 national insurance, and then another 1,200 in pay as you earn and trade union fees. I'm talking about a 4,300 pounds net pay. So there's two things that I really want us to sort of focus on as we just read the initial information. One is firstly the net pay, just to help me to understand that. And the second is the wages expense. The wages expense, as we've already seen, could be the net pay plus all of these things. A shorter cut is really just to say, well, if we know what the gross pay is, that is the cost of the person plus 
any other employer costs. And that's an employer cost. So if I add together the gross pay and the employer costs, I get the wages expense. The cost to the company, what it actually costs me to employ this person. And I do that initially just because I feel like I've got a better handle on the question now. Because to be fair, when I'm marking these, mostly I find people know the debit and the credit. If anything, they just get a little bit muddled with the figures. So hopefully seeing it like this will make it a bit better. So we can start with the wages expense then. It's £6,750. And here's our pick list. Expenses are always debits. So if I can find my wages expense, which I can, it's there in the pick list. This, if you like, is the cost to the company of employing our staff. It's made up of the gross pay together with any other employer costs like employer pension, employer national insurance. So we've got £6,750. It's an expense. It's a cost to the company of £6,750. Now, as I showed you in my other little introduction, everything to do with wages goes through the control account. So it's a debit to the expense and it's a credit to the control account, which in the first instance says, I now have a liability of £6,750. That's the cost of employing my people. I increase the liability to show that I owe £6,750. And that is made up of what I'm going to pay to the staff, what I'm going to pay to the trade union, what I'm going to pay to revenue and customs altogether. That is the cost of my people. So I have to pay that out, but I do it in various parts. So part B is to record the HMRC liability. So out of that 6,750, how much is owing to HMRC? Well, liabilities are always credits. So I'm going to credit my HMRC liability. And all I'm actually doing with this step now is removing some of this liability and putting it in its own account. So rather than leaving the full 6750 as outstanding within wages, it helps me if I know who I've got to pay. And within that 6750, which is the total cost of employing the people, some of that I have to pay to revenue and customs. So let's find out how much. We pay the employee's national insurance, the employer's national insurance, and the income tax. So 1,750 plus another 500, 2,250. That's how much is going to be owing to revenue and customs. So I'm taking it out of the 6,750 liability, which we call wages control and saying, don't want to leave it in there. I'd rather show it in its own account. So debit to wages control and a credit to HMRC liability. So the liability always has to be a credit. I'm reducing the liability here, showing in wages control, because I'm showing the liability instead in the HMRC liability. So we're really just moving the liability from one place to the other. Record the net wages paid to the employees. That one I'd probably start with the bank. I credit the bank because I've paid my people. Everything has to go through wages control. So once I know one side of the double entry, I then also know the other. And again, I reduce the amount that's owing. And I'm reducing the amount owing here because I've paid it. So I debit the liability to remove the net wages that I'm now going to pay. 
and we said the net wages were £4,300. And then finally, part D wanted me to deal with the trade union liability. So using my little pick list, got an account called trade union. Ideally, I'd probably call it trade union liability because it increases the liability. It increases what I owe to the trade union, which was £200 in this example. And that's just a reallocation of the wages control. So the liability is reduced there because I'm showing it in its own account. And then if you want to at the end of all that, if you find it helpful, you can. If you don't find it helpful, there's no need. But you could sketch out the wages control just to see if everything looks to be in order. Because we worked out the cost of employing our people was £6,750. So we said our wages expense is £6,750. We debited expenses, we credited the control and said that is how much you are going to have to pay out. And the next question was, well, who do we pay it to? Well, some of it is going to be payable to revenue and customs. So the pay as you earn and the employer and employees national insurance is payable to HMRC. So I move it out of this account and I move it into the HMRC account. Some of it is paid directly to the staff. The net pay. And the staff were going to be receiving 4,300. So that reduces the liability because I've paid them now. And then I moved the trade union liability as well. And you can see by the end of that little working, everything has actually been dealt with. So that just gives me a little bit of confidence. I've actually got the right figures here. So if you find the T account helpful and my purpose of doing that in the first instance was just to help you see both sides of it. I'm not recommending you draw a full suite of T accounts every time because that's quite a bit of extra work. But I just think in terms of your understanding of what's happening, it might just help. For this lesson, and then I might just use just the wages control account to see, oh, yeah, that's the cost of my people. And this is how it's going to be settled. This is how it's going to be paid. This is how much is going to be paid to each category, if you like. OK, so that was um, the first part of this task, dealing with wages. Does anybody have any questions on that? Otherwise, we do have another little part of it to look at. OK, Veronica, let's have a look. So you're saying, um, yes, of course, you can, Susanna, with pleasure. Uh, what if they don't give you the gross wage? They just give you the wages expense. A very good question. So you're saying if you have the wages expense, how can you calculate the net wages? You just look at this bit again. Wages expense. Let me just write it down for you again here. Wages expense is made up of the gross wages. And then any other employer costs. That could be employer national insurance. It could be employer contribution into the pension. These are things that the employer is paying on your behalf. They're not taking it out of your pay. They're saying we'll pay this over and above what we pay you. This is an additional cost to us. The gross wages are made up of the net wages plus the employee costs, like the pay as you earn, the employer e 
national insurance, the trade union, the employee's pension, etc. So all the deductions. So all the costs that the employee has to pay. It's a bit of a long way around, but I just think this might help to answer your question there. So you said, what if we don't have the gross wage? You've only got the wages expense. Well, with any question, it's a bit like a jigsaw. In order to finish a jigsaw, the only way you can finish a jigsaw puzzle is if you have one missing piece. If there's more than one missing piece, the jigsaw can't be finished. So in an exam question, they might give you the information in another way, but they will only ever give you one missing piece. So just looking at what we have here. If they wanted to do it this way, Veronica, so if you don't have the gross wage, you have the wages expense instead. You can start with the wages expense and you can say, there's my wages expense. What else do I know? I know the employer pension. If there is one. And I know the employer national insurance. So let's say the wages expense is a thousand pounds. The employer national insurance is 60 and the employer pension is 40. It's like a jigsaw. You can now work out that the gross wages, even though they were not given, you can now find must be 900 pounds. So like a jigsaw with a missing piece, they will always give you all the other pieces so you can find that one missing one. So that could be one way that they could get you to find the gross wages if you didn't already know it. The other way that you could find the gross wages is if they told you, let's say the net wages were £750, then they told you that the employee pension was 30, the trade union was 20, the national insurance was, let's say, 80 and the pay as you earn was 120. Yeah, 250. Oh, does that work? 200 and okay, let me just change it so the numbers work. That's better. OK, so if they told you the net wages were 650 and they told you all these various deductions, then again, you could work from the other side and say, well, if I know that and I know all of that and I know the gross wages are 900. So there's no way that they can ask you a question without actually giving you the figures to be able to solve it. So even if you have to do it in a bit of a backwards way, it's possible. OK, so I think the best thing that you can probably do when this lesson is finished at some point, maybe even over the weekend, unless, of course, your exams tomorrow, <laughs> um, is maybe just sort of pull out the AT sample assessments for this task and have a go at these and see, based on what we've chatted about here, whether you can sort of wade your way through the questions there. OK. I'll make sure that bit part gets sent out to you. The latter part of this task is then looking at um, the double entry for a debt that we want to write off. So completely different part of the question, quite likely within this particular task that you'll have wages control alongside some sort of bad or doubtful debt, or possibly even a journal dealing with the correction of an error. So here, our credit customer called Barmy Budges have ceased trading. And unfortunately, when they ceased trading, they owed Dippy Dogs the amount outstanding that's shown in the receivables ledger below. Well, here's the receivables ledger. Remember, the receivables ledger is the memorandum account. Sometimes it's called the subsidiary ledger. It's not part of our double entry. Just an extra little record we keep of the amount owing by each customer. And we're now finding out this customer has gone bust and is never going to pay us whatever is owing. So let's work out what is owing. Let's work out the balance on this person's account. We're going to add them up, find the biggest side. Balancing figure there. Let's 
figure that's needed to make my account add up. So that's what's outstanding. That's how much, unfortunately, Barmy Bridges haven't paid us. They've gone bankrupt, they've gone bust, they've closed down, however we like to say it, and they owed £624, which it seems is now not going to be received. So that will no longer be received. It's going to be bad or irrecoverable, if you like. And the requirement says record the journal entry needed in the general ledger to write off this debt, including the net and the VAT parts. Got a little pick list. So the first thing I think I would do is say, you're telling me that this person is never going to pay me. And you're asking me for the entries in the general ledger. The general ledger is like the nominal ledger. This, the Barmy Budgers account, is part of the memorandum accounts. It is not part of the general ledger. It's just an extra little book where I keep a record of each individual person. It does not form part, form part of my general ledger. So I do need to update the fact that Barmy Budgers are not going to pay me, but rather than doing it in the individual account for Barmy Budgers, I do it instead in the control account. And I do have a control account somewhere. There it is. Receivables, ledger, control. They're not going to pay me, so I'm going to remove them from my receivables ledger. I'm going to reduce the asset. So the receivable ledger control to reduce the asset, showing that this person is never going to pay me. They're going to disappear with my £624. I'm going to reduce the value owing to me from my customers. That's the first part of this. Now, does anybody remember if that is our total, which it is, because we know that's what the customer's not going to pay. How do I split that into the bit that relates to the net figure and the VAT figure? Anybody remember? What's the calculation for finding the net and the VAT figures within here? Very good. Well done, Susanna. Yep, that's how I would do it too. So I'm going to recognise that that £624 has two parts to it. Part of it is VAT and part of it is the actual original sale that's now not going to be received. So when we have a customer that's not going to pay us, rather than just taking it back out of sales as though it never happened, instead we record it in irrecoverable debts. The sale did happen and by taking it out of sales it would suggest it didn't, but it did. It's just that we weren't able to collect the money from the customer. So £624 is the total. So I'm going to divide by 120. Show it like this. So divide by 120 and multiply by 100. And that's going to give me an amount of 500 and... Look, let me be able to work that out, but I think we'll use the calculator. 520. Yeah. So 520 debit. And then the VAT on top of that. You can either say, well, it's the difference between 520 and 624. Or you can say, I know the total is 624. I'm going to divide it by 120. And this time I'm going to times it by 20 because I just want the VAT bit. Either way, you get the same answer. The net plus the VAT must equal the total. And what we're doing there with that calculation, just as a little reminder for you, is recognising that any invoice, when you raise the invoice, your original invoice is for 100%. You then add the VAT on top of that, which is 20%. So the gross invoice becomes 120%. 100% you get to keep, that's your money. 20% gets paid over to Revenue and Customs. And 120% is the total that the customer has to pay you. 
We're now unwinding that and saying the customer is not going to pay you. So they're not going to pay you the full 120 percent. But how much of that do you actually lose out on? And the answer is you lose out on the 100 percent and revenue and customers lose out on the 20 percent. So if I know that that is 624, if I take 624 pounds and divide it by 120, I find the value of 1%. I can then multiply it by 100 to find the net figure or do the same little sum and multiply by 20 to get the VAT figure. So I'm sure that you've seen that done before. There's just various different ways that we can get to that answer. So I thought we'd have a look at a, uh, a couple just as a bit of revision there. So there we have it. We've now seen the adjustments there for both irrecoverable or bad debts, if you like, for that second part, as well as the wages control in the first bit. And that is task five. Task five is actually uh, quite involved. I think it's a little bit more tricky, perhaps, than the other task I've lined up for this evening. So I'm not expecting task three is actually going to take us quite as long. But do please ask if you do have any questions about that one. If everybody's OK with that, I'll just take us back a couple of pages to task number three. And task number three covers a couple of different areas. It covers payment types and picking the appropriate payment type for the payment that you're going to make. And then errors as well tagged on to the end. So with this particular task of ours then, it says show the most appropriate payment for each transaction in the box on the left by linking it to the appropriate payment form, which is in the box on the right. Now, we need to select one payment type for each one of these payments. Each payment type will only be used once. And I mentioned that because I think some of them, there could be more than one right answer. But if I'm only going to use each one once, it might become a bit more obvious as I go through which one I should use where. So the options are I can pay by cash, check, credit card, debit card, standing order, fax or chaps. So a credit card is sort of like a buy now, pay later. So the fact gives it away a little bit in there. Credit, you are basically taking credit. So if I go out and buy a microwave on my credit card, the supplier gets their money straight away. So if I buy from Argos, Argos get the money from the credit card company, but I then get my credit card statement at the end of the month and I have to settle my credit card. So I've taken credit, I've bought the goods and I'm paying for them later. So the supplier still gets paid in the normal way. Argos are not going to let me out of the shop with a microwave unless they've actually had the money for it because they may never see me again. So the supplier gets paid straight away, but I settle the credit card later. I basically take a bit of a loan, if you like, from my credit card provider till it's time to pay off that credit card. So that one sometimes causes a little bit of a confusion. Um, a direct debit is different to a standing order. And I'll explain that one as we go through the list, but they often get confused. And I suppose backs and chaps get confused sometimes as well. So we'll review those as we get to the various uh, bits within the question. So first one, payment of 35 pounds for a rail ticket. Now this one, I think if I was gonna buy a rail ticket, I might pay cash. That could be an option. Would I write out a check? Probably less likely because if I'm standing in the, the station at one of those little automated payment machines, I doubt they're going to let me post a check in. And because the check can also bounce, then probably that they're also not going to accept that as a uh, meaningful way to pay. I could pay by my credit card because they get the money straight away. So they know that they're fine. I then settle it at the end of the month. And it's not even mentioned here, but I could also pay on a debit card. A debit card 
is different to a credit card because it comes straight off your bank balance. So if you had £100 in the bank before, you spend £20 on your, or £30, £35 rather, on your rail ticket, it comes off your bank balance immediately. So that one I feel a bit unsure about, so I'm going to leave that one. Debit card isn't actually one of the options here, but it could be cash or it could be credit cards. I'm hoping it will become obvious when I keep going through the question. The next one. The next one is a quarterly payment of a varying amount for a telephone bill. That word varying amount is really important. Only direct debits have varying amounts. And you may have a direct debit with your electricity provider where you say to them, I don't actually know month on month how much electric I'm going to use. So I'll let you tell me at the end of the month what I've used and you can just take the money from a bank account. You might have a direct debit with your credit card company where you say again, I don't know quite how much I'm going to spend on the credit card. I know that I need to pay you every month, so I just need you to work out how much I owe and to take it straight out of my bank. So that is the direct debit because the amount varies. I'm just actually going to skip to the last one because I want to make sure that you appreciate the difference between the direct debit and the standing order. The last one says a payment of £600 per month to the landlord for rent. That is a fixed amount. So I actually have my rent on a standing order just because otherwise I'll probably forget to pay it. So every month, just after I've got paid, the money gets paid to my landlord. It comes off my bank every month. I've set up the standing order. I have control over it. I say to the bank, please pay the landlord this much for the next 11 months till my lease is finished. And then payments stop. Whereas the direct debit, it is the energy supplier or the telephone provider that says, this is how much you owe us. So this is how much I'm going to take out of your bank. So it's the same amount with a standing order. So that's a really important contrast. The next important contrast, another two that sometimes get a little bit muddled, is chaps and backs. So chaps is a system that we use for paying sort of like one off large payments. One off large amounts. It actually stands for clearing house automatic, or sorry, automated payment system. So as long as you remember one off large figures, what we come to next is the payment of half a million for a shop. So that looks like a one off large figure to me. So I'd give that one to the chaps. Whereas the backs, the backs is very commonly used for payroll. So this tends to be where you've got a group of payees. Who are paid regularly. So you want to make a payment to lots of different people. So you add them all together on the list and say, I want to pay A this much, B this much, C this much, D this much, and E this much. Put it all together. The bank says, OK, that's fine. So we'll take a total of £10,000 from your bank. And then you will go, we'll go off and pay the individual people for you. So for a group of people paid regularly, in this case, the staff, 150 of them, that would be a BAX. So we're nearly done. Oh, we've got two left. We've got a payment of £3.50 for milk for the office kitchen. And my options are credit card, check or cash. I think £3.50, I'm going to go cash. Out of everything that's left, £3.50, I'm going to pay £1,000 here to a supplier or £35 for the rail ticket. I think it's probably more than likely if I'm buying milk for the kitchen, I'm going to grab some cash out the tin and hop along to the shop. So I'm going to go with cash for that one. So that then just leaves two. It leaves a payment to a supplier for £1,000. I think that one, I'm going to put a check in the post. They're going to phone me and say, you still haven't paid. And I'm going to say, don't worry, I'm going to send you a check now. 
So I'm going to go with check for the credit supplier, which leaves me with the rail ticket on the credit card. So it could have been cash or it could have been credit card. I think the cash would be more suited to the small £3.50 milk payment, leaving the credit card for the rail ticket. So with this one, sometimes it might be a bit like that, where it's not a case of like, it's definitely that one or definitely that one. Initially, it's a case of, well, it could be that or it could be that. Let me fill in some others and then see what I've got left. And that's exactly what we had to do here. So it might be like the most right one. But the key things to remember, the difference between the direct debit and the standing order, when do we use backs versus when do we use chaps? And understanding that a debit card, the money gets taken from your bank straight away, but the credit card goes to the supplier straight away, but it only comes off your bank account at the end of the month when you settle your credit card bill. Uh, for that query, Linda, I think your best bet is perhaps just to have a look at the AAT sample assessments. Generally, with debit cards, um, it generally comes off our bank straight away, or it at least sort of shows us pending, and it takes it off our bank balance. But it generally takes a day before it actually gets to the other person. Um, so we're not always going to find that things are so instant. If I swipe my card now, it might only show on the shopkeeper's accounts tomorrow or the next day, but it will be shown. I used to get a little um, ping on my phone just to say, you've just used your debit card, we've taken that money off your account. Okay, so I hope I've demystified a little bit of that for you with that task. Uh, we're just gonna finish off here then with part B, which of the following statements is true? So we just, we've got one mark, we just need to have a read through them. Purchases made using a credit card, remember what I said about that one, a credit card will result in funds being immediately transferred from the business bank account. Is that true? If I swipe my business credit card, does it come straight out of my account? No, it doesn't. That word credit is key, isn't it? You pay later. It pops upon your credit card statement. And it says, this is a list of all your credit transactions in the month. This is how much you now need to pay us. So you're taking a bit of credit. The supplier gets their money. It can take a day or two, as we said, but they get their money almost immediately. But we only get our credit card statement at the end of the month. Purchases made using a cheque will result in funds being immediately transferred from the business bank account. If I write out a cheque, is that an immediate payment? It's not, is it? Because cheques are actually old school now. Cheques are a bit of a hassle. I'm actually in the process of renewing my driving licence and I need to send a cheque. I don't think I've used my chequebook in years. It's going to be interesting because I've got to find it first. But uh, the cheque can take maybe five days plus to clear. So it can take some time. So that one is false. So let's hope the last one looks true. Payments made using a faster payment will result in funds being immediately transferred from the business bank account. That one is true. And I have used this faster payment service before. Let's say if I was, uh, let's say I'm buying a car and the person that I found in, in the auto trader says, well, no problem, you can buy my car. And I say, great, here's a check. And they say, no, I don't think so. You're not driving away in the car and giving me a check because you could cancel the check. You might not have money in your bank. So the only way that I'm going to allow you to drive away with the car today is if you can show me the money popping up in my bank account today. So we can use a faster payment. So it shows in the beneficiary's bank straight away. That one's true. Okay. So there you go. That's the end of task three. So I thought that was quite a nice one to finish on. So what we have actually done over the four sessions where we have worked through this, uh, this mock assessment is we've covered all tasks apart from one. So that one was a, um, I think it was task number seven, which was a 
trial balance extract, very similar to task eight, which we did do. So that left you with task seven to try at home, but all the others you now have got recordings for or have attended live. So I've actually looked at a whole mock from start to finish. So I hope you found that useful. I'm going to stop the recording and sign out. So for those of you at home, thank you very much. I hope that you found it useful. And for those of you that are with me live, I'll stop the recording and then deal with any individual questions.